Black Elk Speaks by John G. Nahart. Introduction by Vine Deloria Jr. <laughs> Chapter 2 Early Boyhood. I am a Lakota of the Ogallala Band. My father's name was Black Elk, and his father before him bore the name, and the father of his father, so that I am the fourth to bear it. He was a medicine man, and so were several of his brothers. Also, he and the great crazy horse's father were cousins, having the same grandfather. <coughs> My mother's name was White Cow Seas. Her father was called Refuse to Go, and her mother Plenty Eagle Feathers. I can remember my mother's mother and her father. My father's father was killed by the Pawnees when I was too little to know, and his mother, Red Eagle Woman, died soon after. I was born in the moon of the popping trees, December, on the Little Powder River, in the winter when the four crows were killed, 1863. And I was three years old when my father's right leg was broken in the Battle of the Hundred Slain, from that wound, he limped until the day he died, which was about the time when Bigfoot's band was butchered on Wounded Knee, 1890. He is buried here in these hills. I can remember that winter of the hundred slain as a man, as a man may remember some bad dream he dreamed when he was little. But I cannot tell just how much I heard when I was bigger and how much I understood when I was little. <clears throat> it is like some fearful thing in a fog, for it was a time when everything seemed troubled and afraid. I had never seen a wasa a wasachu then and did not know what one looked like. But everyone was saying that the Wasachus were coming, and that they were going to take our country and rub us all out, and that we would all have to die fighting. <coughs> it was the Wasachus who got rubbed out in that battle, and all the people were talking about it for a long time, but a hundred Wasachus was not much if there were others and others without number where those came from. I remember once <clears throat> that I asked my grandfather about this. I said, when the scouts come back from seeing the prairie full of bison somewhere, that people say the Wasachus are coming. And when strange men are coming to kill us all, they say the Wasachus are coming. What does it mean? And he said that they are many. When I was older, I learned what the fighting was about that winter and the next summer. Up on the Madison Fork, the Wasachus had found much of the yellow metal that they worship, and that makes them crazy. And they wanted to have a road up through our country to the place where the yellow metal was, but my people did not want the road. It would scare the bison and make them go away, and also it would let the other Wasachus come in like a river. They told us that they wanted only to use a little land, as much as a wagon would take between the wheels, but our people knew better. And when you look about you now, you can see what it was they wanted. <clears throat> Once we were happy in our country, and we were seldom hungry, for then the two legs and the four legs lived together like relatives, and there was plenty for them and for us. But the Wasachus came. And they have made little islands for us and other little islands for the four-leggeds. And always these islands are becoming smaller, for around them surges the gnawing flood of the Wasachu, and it is dirty with lies and greed. A long time ago my father told me what his father told him, that there was once a Lakota holy man called Drinkswater, who dreamed what was to be. And this was long before the coming of the Wasachus. He dreamed that the four leggeds were going back into the earth and that a strange race had woven a spider's web all around the Lakotas. And he said, When this happens, you shall live in square gray houses in a barren land, and beside those square gray houses, you shall starve. They say he went back to Mother Earth soon after he saw this vision, and it was. <clears throat> and it was sorrow that killed him. You can look about you now and see that he meant these dirt-roofed houses we are living in. 
and that all the rest was true. Sometimes dreams are wiser than wa than waking. And so when the soldiers came and built themselves a, built themselves a town of logs, there on the piney fork of the powder, my people knew they meant to have their road and take our country and maybe kill us all when they were strong enough. Crazy Horse was only about 19 years old then, and Red Cloud was still our great chief. In the moon of the changing season, October, he called together all the scattered bands of the Lakota for a big council on the Powder River. And when we went on the warpath against the soldiers, a horseback could ride through our villages from sunrise until the day was above <coughs> his head. So far did our camp stretch along the valley of the river for many of our friends, the sh the shy the sh the Shila <laughs> and the blue clouds had come to help us fight. And it was about when the bitten moon was delayed last quarter, and the time of the popping trees, when the hundred were rubbed out. My friend, Fire Thunder here, who was older than I, was in that fight, and he can tell you how it was. Fire Thunder speaks. I was 16 years old when this happened, and after the big council on the powder, we had moved over to the Tongue River, where we were camping at the mouth of Penno Creek. There were many of us there. Red Cloud was over all of us, but the chief of our band was Big Road. We started out on horseback just about sunrise, riding up the creek toward the soldier's town on the Piney, for we were going to attack it. <coughs> The sun was about halfway up when we stopped at the place where the Wasachus road came down a steep, narrow ridge and crossed the creek. It was a good place to fight, so we sent home some men ahead to coax the soldiers out. While they were gone, we divided into two parts and hid in the gullies on both sides of the ridge and waited. After a long while, we heard a shot up over the hill, and we knew the soldiers were coming. So we held the noses of our ponies that they might not whinny at the soldiers' horses. Soon we saw our men coming back, and some of them were walking and leading their horses so that the soldiers would think they were worn out. Then the men we had sent ahead came running down the road between us, and the soldiers on horseback followed shooting. When they came to the flat at the bottom of the hill, the fighting all began at once. I had a sorrel horse, and just as I was going to get on him, the soldiers turned around and began to fight their way back up the hill. I had a six shooter that I had traded for, and also a bow and arrows. When the soldiers started back, I held my sorrel with one hand and began killing them with the six shooter, for they came close to me. There were many bullets, but there were more arrows. So many that it was like a cloud of grasshoppers all above and around the soldiers, and our people shooting across hit each other. The soldiers were falling all the while they were fighting back up the hill, and their horses got loose. Many of our people chased the horses, but I was not after horses. I was after Wasachus. When the soldiers got on top, there were not many of them left, and they had no place to hide. They were fighting hard. We were told to crawl up on them, and we did. When we were close, someone yelled, Let us go. This is a good day to die. Think of the helpless ones at home. Then we all cried, Hoka hey, and rushed at them. I was young then, and quick on my feet, and I was one of the first to get in among the soldiers. They got up and fought very hard until not one of them was alive. They had a dog with them, and he started back up the road for the soldier's town, howling as he ran. He was the only one left. I did not shoot at him because he looked too sweet, but many did shoot, and he died full of arrows. So there was nobody left of the soldiers. Dead men and horses and wounded Indians were scattered all the way up the hill, and their blood was frozen. For a storm had come up, and it was very cold, and getting colder all the time. We left all the dead lying there, for the ground was solid, and we picked up our wounded and started back. But we lost most of them before we reached our camp at the mouth of the Penno. 
There was a big blizzard that night, and some of the wounded, who did not die on the way, died after we got home. This was the time when Black Elk's father had his leg broken. Black Elk continues. I'm quite sure that I remember the time when my father came home with a broken leg that he got from killing so many Wasachus, and it seems that I can remember all about the battle too, but I think I could not. It must be the fear that I remember most. All this time I was not allowed to play very far away from our teepee, and my mother would say, if you are not good, the Wasachus will get you. We must have broken camp at the mouth of the Penno soon after the battle, for I can remember my father lying on a pony drag with bison robes all around him, like a baby, and my mother riding the pony. The snow was deep and it was very cold, and I remember sitting in another pony drag beside my father and mother, all wrapped up in fur. We were going away from, the sol from where the soldiers were, and I do not know where we went, but it was west. It was a hungry winter, for the deep snow made it hard to find the elk, and also many of the people went snow blind. We wandered a long time, and some of the bands got lost from each other. Then at last, we were camping in the woods beside a creek somewhere, and the hunters came back with meat. I think it was this same winter when a medicine man, by the name of Creeping, went around among the people curing snow blinds. He would put snow upon their eyes, and after he had sung a certain sacred song that he had heard in a dream, he would blow on the backs of their heads, and they would see again, so I have heard. It was about the dragonfly that he sang, for that was where he got his power, they say. When it was summer again, we were camping on the rosebud, and I did not feel so much afraid, because the wasachu seemed far farther away, and there was peace. There in the valley, and there was plenty of meat. But all the boys from five or six years up were playing war. The little boys would gather together from the different bands of the tribe and fight each other with mud balls that they threw with willow sticks. And the big boys played the game called throwing them off their horses, which is a battle all but the killing. And sometimes they got hurt. <clears throat> The horsebacks from the different bands would line up and charge upon each other, yelling, and when the ponies came together on the run, they would rear and flounder and scream in a big dust, and the riders would seize each other, wrestling until one side had lost all of its men, for those who fell upon the ground were counted dead. When I was older, I too often played this game. We were always naked when we played it, just as warriors are when they go into battle, if it is not too cold because they are swifter without clothes. Once I fell off on my back, right in the middle of a bed of prickly pears, and it took my mother a long while to pick all the stickers out of me. I was still too little to play war that summer, but I can remember watching the other boys, and I thought that when we all grew up and were big together, maybe we could kill all the Wasachus or drive them far away from our country. It was in the moon when the cherries turned black, August, that all the people were talking again about the battle, and our warriors came back with many wounded. It was the attacking of the wagons, and it made me afraid again, for we did not win that battle as we did the other one, and there were much mourning for the dead. Fire Thunder was in that fight too, and he can tell you how it was that day. Fire Thunder Speaks it was very bad. There was a wide, flat prairie with hills around it, and in the middle of this was Wasachus had put the boxes of their wagons in a circle so that they could keep their mules there at night. There were not many Wasachus, but they were lying behind the boxes, and they shot faster than they ever shot at us before. We thought it was some new medicine of great power that they had, for they shot so fast that it was like tearing a blanket. Afterwards, I learned that it was because they had new guns that they loaded from behind, and this was the first time they used these guns. We came on after sunrise. There were many, many of us, and we meant to ride right over them and rub them out, but our ponies were afraid of the ring of the fire the guns of the Wasachus made. It would not go over. Our women were watching us from the hills, and we could hear them singing and mourning whenever the shooting stopped. We tried hard, but we could not do it. 
and there were dead warriors and horses piled all around the boxes and scattered over the plain. Then we left our horses in a glutch and charged on foot, but it was like green grass withering in a fire. So we picked up our wounded and went away. I do not know how many of our people were killed, but there were very many. It was bad. Black Elk continues. I do not remember where we camped that winter, but it must have been a time of peace and of plenty to eat. Standing Bear speaks. I'm four years older than Black Elk, and he and I have been good friends since boyhood. I know it was on the powder that we camped where there were many cottonwood trees. Ponies like to eat the bark of these trees, and it is good for them. That was the winter when High Shirt's mother was killed by a big tree that fell on her teepee. It was a very windy night, and there were noises that woke me. And then I heard that an old woman had been killed, and it was High Shirt's mother. Black Elk continues. I was four years old then, and I think it must have been the next summer that I first heard the voices. It was a happy summer, and nothing was afraid, because in the moon, when the pony shed, May. Word came from the Wasachus that there would be peace, and that they would not use the road any more, and that all the soldiers would go away. The soldiers did go away, and their towns were torn down, and in the moon of falling leaves, November, they made a treaty with Red Cloud that said our country would be ours as long as grass should grow and water flow. You can see that it is not the grass and the water that have forgotten. Maybe it was not this summer when I first heard the voices, but I think it was because I know it was before I played with bows and arrows or rode a horse, and I was out playing alone when I heard them. It was like somebody calling me, and I thought it was my mother, but there was nobody there. This happened more than once and always made me afraid so that I ran home. It was when I was five years old that my grandfather made me a bow and some arrows. The grass was young and I was horseback. A thunderstorm was coming from where the sun goes down and just as I was riding into the woods along a creek, there was a king bird sitting on a limb. This was not a dream, it happened. And I was going to shoot at the king bird with my bow and my grandfather that my grandfather made when the bird spoke and said, The clouds all over are one sided. Perhaps it meant that all the clouds were looking at me. And then it said, Listen, a voice is calling you. Then I looked up at the clouds, and two men were coming there, head first like arrows slanting down, and as they came they sang a sacred song, and the thunder was like drumming. I will sing it for you. The song and the drumming were like this. Behold, a sacred voice is calling you. All over the sky, a sacred voice is calling. I sat there gazing at them, and they were coming from the place where the giant lives north. But when they were very close to me, they wheeled about toward where the sun goes down, and suddenly they were geese. Then they were gone, and the rain came with a big wind and a roaring, I did not tell this vision to anyone. I liked to think about it, but I was afraid to tell it. 